Are you feeling the independent spirit? The island is buzzing with activities. Visit the JCDC's website to get a list of the celebrations taking place all over the country. Remember to wear the vibes. Show your national pride during the season in your red, gold, emerald and black. Let's celebrate our ability to make our decisions and chart our paths. I'm Adrian Atkinson. Thank you for joining us for another edition of Jamaica Magazine. In today's show, get the facts on immunization, plus take in the life and legacy of the right excellent Paul Vogel. And later, we'll stop by the Kingston Parish Church. Stay tuned. Nutritious food. Succulent dishes superior workmanship, and excellent service. Jamaica is on the go. Let's grow what we eat and eat what we grow. Let's harness the indomitable spirit of our most valued resource, our people. Let's support our local businesses. After all, buying Jamaica means building Jamaica. Original. Good day, I'm Stephen McHugh and this is your JIS News for Tuesday, August 2. National Security Minister Robert Montague has approved an interim plan of action to be implemented at the Firearm Licensing Authority, FLA. This follows the resignation of the board in light of alleged improprieties at the authority. The actions were outlined by Information Minister Senator Royal Reed at a Jamaica House press briefing Wednesday. The Firearm Licensing Authority should not issue any approval for gun licenses or permits for the next seven working days. Two, the Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Shane Darling, over the same period of seven working days, will provide an update of the process of the Ministry of National Security Assessment Report on the Firearm Licensing Authority 2017 Allen Report and the status of the implementation of the recommendations to the minister. Minister Reed says the authority's CEO and staff are to give full support to the Justice Seymour Panton Review Panel to ensure full transparency and the integrity of the FLA. Following this, Cabinet will be briefed on the situation. The Tourism Enhancement Fund will be spending $1.2 billion over the next four years in Montego Bay to give the resort town a facelift. This is in addition to the $2.8 billion spent by the fund in the last 10 years. We're going to be reconfiguring the entire area from what is proverbially called Dumper Beach straight through to Dead End, which includes the hip strip that is occupying your mind somewhat. Somebody will want me to tell you that the private and public sector together have combined to create a new look experience that is going to define a new attraction and indeed a new presence of Montego Bay in the global tourism market. Tourism Minister Edmund Bartlett was speaking recently at the Invest Mobe Breakfast Forum. Among the projects are the relocation of utility wires underground, a $600 million closed harbor park, $110 million to improve water distribution, a $35 million roadway resurfacing project from Summit Police Station to Dead End, as well as a $60 million streetscaping and improvement of the airport roundabout. $252 million will be spent on landscaping the elegant corridor, and a $40 million program is underway to enhance the flankers' community on that roadway. The tourism minister, meanwhile, is encouraging greater investment in the European plan hotels along the Montego Bay hip strip. Under the European plan, prices quoted are strictly for lodging with meals, taxes and tips being billed separately. Even as he supports the build-out of all-inclusive hotels, Mr. Bartlett says the EP model will enable greater earnings from tourism. The guest is not interested anymore in destinations or even brands as we know them. They are now interested in experiences. And so to make Montego Bay pristine and come to mind, we have to build out experiences. 
Part of that build-out, Minister Bartlett says, is greater investment in food tourism, which has some 88% of the world traveling for food. Permanent secretaries and heads of agencies across government are now up to speed with their role in the implementation of the recently passed Zones of Special Operations Bill. Prime Minister Andrew Holness on Monday updated government on the social intervention aspect of the bill. The act provides for special security measures in high crime areas while simultaneously ensuring social intervention. Stressing the importance of national security, Mr. Holness told the meeting that once a zone is declared, government agencies must make the needs of the zone their priority. Social intervention committees will be established within five days of the zone being declared and will be under the joint command of the Jamaica Constabulary and the Defense Forces. And finally, Prime Minister Andrew Holness is calling on Jamaicans to use emancipation as a foundation to advance their freedom, particularly from criminals. We certainly cannot afford to betray history by any retreat or surrender. We cannot cede one inch of emancipated Jamaica to any force that would impinge on our freedom. We owe it to those who fought tirelessly and defiantly for our emancipation to ensure that no Jamaican today has their freedom trampled by criminal forces. The Prime Minister was addressing the nation on Tuesday in his Emancipation Day message. Leader of the Opposition, Dr. Peter Phillips, made a similar call for citizens to live in dignity, work in harmony, and to secure a better economic future. The examples of our freedom fighters must inspire us to assert our rights to live in a Jamaica that provides social justice and equality of opportunity to housing, to good security, health care, quality education and training, and a chance for progress and personal fulfillment. And that's it for GIS News Today. I'm Stephen McHugh. Thanks for watching. Nominations are now open for the 2017 Prime Minister's Youth Awards for Excellence. Persons 15 to 29 years old may apply and be recognized for their work in 11 exciting categories. There's also a Jamaica 55 commemorative category for youth engaged in community-based volunteerism. Access nomination forms by visiting moey.gov.jm, youthjamaica.com or any youth information center across the island. Nominations close August 31. Is that time again when we begin back-to-school preparations? No, it's not too early if you want to be stress-free or somewhere near there. Come September, trust me. And on the things to-do list should be ensuring your child is physically prepared for the school environment. How? Getting him or her fully immunized. Here's why this is important. Immunization is arguably one of the most cost-effective healthcare interventions ever invented. Since the first successful vaccine was developed to treat smallpox in 1796, vaccination has been preventing illnesses and deaths for millions of people around the world. According to the World Health Organization, about 2 to 3 million deaths are prevented each year because of persons taking up vaccines or being immunized. Through vaccination, smallpox was declared eradicated from the world in 1980, and that's a significant achievement. Other diseases are on the verge of being eradicated through the process of immunization here in Jamaica. Immunization has led to a substantial reduction of illnesses and death from diseases such as polio, measles, uh, whooping cough, and newborn tetanus. Measles deaths have decreased by almost 80% uh, over the past 10 years, which again is uh, a significant achievement. Jamaica's immunization program has managed to eliminate a number of vaccine-preventable diseases over the years. These include polio, which usually left children paralyzed. Jamaica had the last case, for example, of polio in 1982. The last case of locally transmitted measles in 1991. The last case of diphtheria in 1995. The last case of rubella in 2000. And the last case of newborn tetanus in 2001. 
In 2011, the country recorded 100% immunization coverage for BCG or tuberculosis. Thanks to the expanded program on immunization, EPI, which began in 1976, the population coverage against vaccine-preventable diseases remains relatively high. Under the program, immunization coverage for children under 2 years old reached 93-94% to 94 in 2010-2011. The expanded program on immunization provides free vaccination to children ages 0 to 7 during the routine immunization schedule of the Ministry of Health. This is an integral strategy to reduce child mortality and morbidity. First, we give at birth up to six weeks of age BCG vaccine, which is given usually in the hospital setting, and BCG protects against tuberculosis. At six weeks, three months, and six months, babies are due a vaccine against polio, which prevents poliomyelitis, as well as the pentavalent vaccine or the five-in-one vaccine. Then at 12 months of age, the MMR vaccine is administered to protect children against measles, mumps and rubella. At 18 months, we give the first set of booster vaccines and we give boosters again for MMR. The children get DPT as well, which is for diphtheria, pertussis and tetanus. And then they also get the polio vaccine at that time as well. Between the ages of four to six years, children must get a second booster vaccine for DPT as well as a second booster vaccine for polio. A lot of these vaccine preventable diseases are actually quite contagious and can cause death, especially among our young children. And so therefore, I would encourage parents to ensure that their children are appropriately vaccinated. In Jamaica, children must be fully immunized before entry to school. And that is usually a part of mandatory school medicals due before the start of each academic year. They have to present the immunization record at the health facility to confirm that the vaccines indeed have been done. And if they are missing any vaccines for whatever reason, then they are provided for them at the health facility. The immunization record is part of the Child Health Development Passport introduced for every child in 2010 to replace the immunization cards used previously. As part of its public education initiative, the Ministry of Health displays posters and other material at health centers and schools, reminding parents and caregivers about the immunization schedules, showing what vaccine is due and when. Disease surveillance is also practiced at ports of entry to combat the country's increased susceptibility to new diseases due to globalization and increased travel. Across the board, government is on a mission to improve the health of the nation by making traditional vaccines available and exploring new and non-traditional vaccines to tackle other diseases. For example, the mitigation of NCDs like some cancers which can be prevented through vaccination, such as the vaccine for the human papilloma virus, which causes cervical cancer, falls in, the line, in line with the Ministry of Health strategic plan to improve the offering to the public. And the commitment today is that we will work to ensure that other vaccines on the market with a proven track record are introduced as part of our routine administration to our population. The year was 1895. Our ancestors were no longer required to work on the plantation, but they did not have much rights. Most were poor, did not have access to education, and couldn't vote. Paul Bogle, though more fortunate than many, didn't like the treatment meted out to the masses. Here's his story. One thing I want people to understand about Paul Bogle. Paul Bogle was the richest black man inside of Jamaica in 1865. He owned 503 acres of land.
when you look at what Paul Bogle honed, Paul Bogle didn't have to give his life for his country. Yet he did. And for that, he was declared a national hero in 1969, the highest honor that could be awarded by a grateful nation. The history of his life and death tells us that the journey to that pinnacle of national recognition was one fraught with danger and ultimately deadly. In the latter months of 1865, Paul Bogle and others of like mind had exhausted their tolerance for the unfair treatment being meted out to black people in colonial Jamaica. After almost 30 years of emancipation, their access to land, good wages and civil and legal rights were being stifled, based solely on the color of their skin. Paul Bogle, a Baptist preacher from Stony Gut in St. Thomas, had come to be seen as the governor of the blacks. So when he began his fateful 50-mile march to the then capital, Spanish Town, they followed and were denied the audience they sought with governor at the time, Edward John Eyre. Paul Bogle was relentless and the preacher and his men would later descend on the Morant Bay Courthouse while it was in session, determined to have their say. History has labeled that incident the Morant Bay Rebellion. What began as a peaceful gathering to agitate for the fair and equal treatment of all citizens, black or white, ended in chaos and bloodshed. In the end, more than 430 people were killed, hundreds more flogged, 1,000 dwellings destroyed, and the courthouse razed by fire. For this rebellious act, Bogle was deemed the instigator, and in October 1865, he was captured and hanged. Bogle has to be looked at in the context of his own, of his own actions. We need to understand that in 1865, Bogle, in many respects, was representing what people of his group, people of his neighborhood, people of his historical background were faced with. This is just um, a few years, maybe less than 30 years after emancipation. And emancipation in 1838 had simply not brought the blessings that most ex slaves had hoped for. One blessing that they'd look for was land. That didn't come. They might also have hoped for some sense of equality. That hadn't come either. Because while in theory all Jamaicans were citizens, they were certainly not equal in the eyes of the law. We have recourse today to many things. We have recourse to the newspapers, to the courts, to the parliament, etc. You know, we have places we can turn to. I mean, we can talk, call up the talk show host and raise the devil. We can write terrible letters to the newspapers. We can demand to see our member of parliament, etc. Bogle and those guys didn't have anything like that. You know, so you can't equate the two things at all. And uh, don't forget what they tried to do. They even wrote a letter to the Queen, you know. They walk all the way to Spanish Town to see here. I mean, these guys tried everything. They were not to be confused with agitators on the street. They were not that. Bogle's sacrifice was not in vain. The Morant Bay Rebellion would become the catalyst for many developments in Jamaica. Education, health, and social services, the things for which Bogle agitated, would eventually be greatly improved. Still, the sacrifice was not all Paul Bogle's. Others who bore his name would later face prejudice and persecution for his actions on and before that fateful day. The Morant Bay Rebellion, as it was called, you know, caused the Bogle family to live, to live a bush like wild animals. My father and my grandfather told me that um, it was illegal to educate any Bogle in Jamaica. Many people in St. Thomas who named Bogle, they can't even relate Paul Bogle's story good enough. Because guess what? It's not something that the family get into easily. Because until this day, sad to say, but it has divided the family. The family never, ever come back to what they used to be because of Martin Bay Rebellion. Still, the family is proud of its elder and feels some vindication in his eventual recognition as a national hero. 
what really drives a deacon that is on the pulpit, a man that is not in need of anything to do something like that. That is the broader point. Paul Vogel, the father of seven children, a sibling to five brothers, owner of his own little kingdom, a black man who in 1865 had the right to vote, was a warrior for equal rights, a man who was resolute in the fight for his people. Provided for. And included. Don't beat me up. Don't belittle me and please don't molest me. I am under 13. I should not be working for a living. That is child labor. It is illegal. Stop leaving me alone. I am too young to provide for myself. I need your guidance. Protect our nation's children. They have rights too. To learn more about children's rights, call or visit the offices of the Child Development Agency. Even though we don't have to fight for certain civil liberties, like our ancestors, there are still worthy causes that each of us can stand up for. For example, you can be a hero by reporting cases of child abuse, make our country safer by reporting criminal activities, protect this beautiful land we love by properly disposing of garbage. These simple acts and so many others give us all the opportunity to make our country the place of choice to live, work, raise families, and do business. Keep we island clean, so clean. From the peaks to the beach, so clean. Now the tea of Jamaica, please don't do it. Keep we island clean, so clean. From the peaks to the beach, so clean. Now the tea of Jamaica, please don't do it. No dash, no paper, no dash, no plastic. Dispose your garbage responsibly. No know how to recycle. Learn it pick, and if you drop it, better pick up every piece of it. Plastics last forever. Don't forget the bits. Cause when them touch the street, them end up in the sea. Collect pan the reef where they fish them feed. And when you want seafood, I eat your eat. Island clean. So clean. From the peaks to the beach. So clean. Now the tea of Jamaica. Please don't do it. Not a tea of Jamaica, not a tea of Jamaica, not a tea of Jamaica, not a tea of Jamaica. Rising from the rubbles of the 1907 earthquake, the Kingston Parish Church stands as a reminder of the resilience of the people of this country. Discover the beauty of its design in our next feature. <music> It's been twice built, and after a more than 300-year history, still stands as a monument of fine architectural achievement and the resilience of a city and its people. On the afternoon of Monday, January 14, 1907, the residents of Jamaica's capital city found themselves under an avalanche of dust clouds and falling rubble, jarred loose from buildings rocked by a 6.5 magnitude earthquake. The damage was all-encompassing and left many questioning the future of the city. But in the months and years that followed, Kingston and Kingstonians began laying the foundation for a sturdier, more resilient city. The Church of St. Thomas the Apostle, 
was one of the institutions to find new life after the devastation of 1907. From that point on, it would stand as the Kingston Parish Church. In 1911, the Anglican Church, which stands on the corner of South Parade and King Street, was consecrated after being built on the foundations of the structure destroyed in 1907. Its predecessor, which had served as the state church of the island since the 17th century, is believed to have been built in or before 1699. The new concrete structure of the 20th century was designed to reflect the style of the original, with the exception of a clock tower added in memory of those who died in World War I. It is this clock that is said to be the inspiration for the popular phrase describing Kingstonians as people born under the clock. The Kingston Parish Church is a study in the best that Georgian architecture has to offer. Its gleaming white edifice with the cross shape, high steeple and bell tower is framed by stained glass windows dating back to the 1700s. Beyond its architectural details, the Kingston Parish Church holds within its walls many relics and monuments that detail interesting developments and personalities that have shaped the history of the capital. One of its most iconic features is the imposing organ said to have been built in 1722. Statues of St. Mary and St. Thomas, donated by the Chinese and Syrian communities, are among many gifts from prominent Jamaican families that adorn the church's altar. A French chalice from 1689 and a collection of church plates from 1701 find a home beside artwork and sculptures from some of Jamaica's best. Among its monuments is one in memory of John Woolmer, a wealthy Kingston goldsmith who left money in his will to build a free school in the city. And soldiers of the West Indian regiments who died during the colonial wars are remembered in marble plaques on the site. For more than 300 years, from so-called commoners to royalty, this church has been the point of worship for generations of Kingstonians, bearing witness to many of Jamaica's historic milestones. This is where we close the pages of another Jamaica magazine, but our story continues online. Visit our YouTube channel or our website to watch other editions. We value your feedback, so send us an email or drop us a message on Facebook or Twitter. On behalf of all of us here at the JIS, I'm Adrian Atkinson. Thanks for watching. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.